you please stand with me as we worship this morning?
you, Lord, there is always a new song, and we can sing to you, our great and glorious God. We bless you this morning, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Please take a seat if you're in the room here this morning, and hello to those who are visiting us online this morning. Uh, we have a bit of fun usually on a Sunday morning at this time in our service. It's time for our kids' talk, and our kids' talk has been shaken up a bit of late, but I know everyone has missed Stuart's voices that they used to hear online. Isn't that right in the room? Yes? Yes, and Miss Stewart's voice. There's a couple of those there, but I'm going to try and not remember those. Uh, but uh, this morning we have the pleasure of again hearing from our, our senior minister and his wonderful voices as we look at Zach the taxman. And um, fortunately, Stuart in a, a former profession was an accountant, so, you know, he's especially attuned to this subject, I believe. So enjoy Zach the taxman. This is Zacchaeus, Big Zach of Jericho, a little man with a big heart. You might think he's always been generous, but he hasn't. This is Zach's story. Let's go back to the start. Here is Zach's old school photo. Can you see him? Yep, that's him right down in front with a Z on his jumper. Zach didn't like school much. At lunchtime, he was never picked to play basketball. Well, have dangerous Dave, agile Aiden, and incredible eye owner. I'll have jumping Josh, airtime Ash, and leaping Luke. You could have Zach. No, you have him. Zach, you can be scorer. But worst of all, and I know this would never happen at your school, but the kids used to tease Zach. They'd point at him and sing, Snorty, snorty, Zacchaeus is a shorty. They would laugh a lot, thinking that they were very, very funny. That made Zach sad. Then he got mad. Then he decided to get even. Zach came up with a brilliant plan. <laughs> 
Because Zach was always the scorer, he became very good with numbers. For weeks, Zach did everybody's homework. Let me do your homework for you. Until nobody could do their own homework themselves. Then he started charging $10 each sum. Soon, Zach had lots of money. No one liked him, but Zach didn't care. That's the story of Zach at school. When Zacchaeus grew up, he was so good with numbers that he became a tax collector. His job was to collect money from all the people in Jericho and send it to the king. Zach still wanted to get even with everyone who had teased him at school, so he collected a little bit extra. One dollar, thousand dollars for the king, two thousand dollars for me. One thousand dollars for the king, five thousand dollars for me. One thousand dollars for the king, ten thousand dollars for me. <laughs> One day, Jesus came to Jericho. Zach was so excited he joined the crowd waiting for Jesus. He could tell, but he couldn't see. He tried jumping, but because he hadn't ever played basketball at school, he couldn't jump high enough to see Jesus. He tried pushing, but no one liked Zach, so they wouldn't let him in. So Zach came up with a brilliant plan. He climbed up a tree. People pointed to Zach and sang, Snorty, snorty, Zacchaeus is a shorty. Zach didn't care. He could see Jesus. Jesus came closer and closer, stopped right under Zach, looked up and said, Zach, hurry down. I want to stay with you today. Zach no longer felt sad. He didn't feel mad or want to get even. Zach was happy. No one had ever picked him before. Everyone else was angry. Why did they pick shorty, snorty, greedy Zach, they grumbled. Zach said to Jesus, I will give half my money to the people who are poor, and everyone I cheated, I will give back four times as much as I took. Zach belongs to God's family, Jesus told the people. Hooray, said everyone. I've got a brilliant plan, said Zach. Let's go to my place for lunch. You can you clap. You are allowed to clap, it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, interesting. Uh, so, well, we <laughs> now we've got the claps, though. Well done. Good job, Stuart. <laughs> Let's uh, continue to sing and praise God together. Would you please stand to your feet? Praise be a weapon that silences the enemy. Let praise be a weapon that conquers all anxiety. Let it rise. Let praise arise. We sing your name in the dark and it changes everything. We sing with all we are and we claim your victory, let it rise, let praise arise, oh, we'll see you break down every wall, we'll watch the giants fall, for fear cannot survive when we praise you, the God of
song that overcomes the raging sea. Will faith be the song that calms the storm inside of me? Let it freely given. Thank you that the Holy Spirit is with us. We come to an opening prayer. Loving God, you have called and commissioned the church to bring good news to all people. Give us boldness to live out our faith and teach us always to be ready to give a reason for the hope that is in us so that the whole world may know the power and impact of a relationship with Jesus Christ. We ask this in his name and in the Spirit's power. Amen. Amen. Now have a Bible reading.
Well, welcome to Conversation Corner. Uh, we're doing uh, a few different things during this series, uh, God is Possible. And one of them is that we're not actually going to have a traditional type of sermon every single week. We're going to have a conversation. And joining with uh, me is the amazing uh, Reverend Marianne Rolfs. Um, you might have heard me use the expression, God is possible, uh, pretty much from uh, the beginning of the season uh, that we're finding ourselves living in. Uh, like all good um, ministers, um, I steal my material from other people, um, and I stole that material from Mary Ann, but she's also a good minister, and I think she stole that from somebody else. So uh, can you tell us a little bit of a background before we have a look at this uh, Bible passage on the origin story of God is Possible? pleasure over the last few years of doing some uh, further study, especially focused around chaplaincy studies. One of the books I discovered early on in that process was a book called Making God Possible uh, by a guy who's a Church of England vicar. And it really resonated because I figured that what I was trying to do with the students and the staff and the families that I minister to at Coomera Anglican College is this idea of making God possible. I was particular. I you think about the connection um, with the information that we have from the 2016 Australian Census, which is our last census, and it clearly states that really a, a much larger pop- proportion of the population than we would expect still choose to call themselves Christian. However, the growing number of people that we see in that um, census are people who identify as having no religion. But what I observe, and I'm sure that you do too, with the people that are your neighbours, the people who live in your complexes, the people that um, you engage with at work, is that they might say they have no religion, but they certainly are looking for some kind of spirituality. They would say they're religious. Um, They're not religious, but they are spiritual. And so making God possible, um, as a minister of Christ, making God possible just really captured that idea of Uh, helping people here and now to reimagine for themselves that God may indeed be possible. I think the um, every time the census rolls around it reminds us that the world is changing and and I think this year we've probably changed more than we have um, in certainly in my lifetime Uh, but Mary and I, Mary Ann and I have something in common Um, we both grew up immersed in church culture Um, Both of our our dads are ministers, Um, and so we grew up knowing the right way to sit in church, the Bible stories um, that uh, I make funny voices for. um, I knew from a a very small uh, age of a very small child, but things aren't like that anymore. Um, And so we find ourselves in a culture that doesn't know those Bible stories anymore. They don't necessarily know what to do if they came into a church building. I'm not sure how many times I've heard somebody say to me, oh, I hope the walls don't fall down if I walk into a church building. Um, and so there, there is that divide that we see emerging in the society in which we live that doesn't understand what church is and what church does. But I'm sure in an Anglican school, everybody understands what church is. Is that right? No. <laughs> I guess in an Anglican school, I'm sure that Anne finds this at All Saints, um, and most of our chaplains do, that the demographic of um, families in our schools pretty much represents the demographic of wider society. And the director of our early learning centre says she has children who begin in the early learning centre who have no concept whatsoever of God. It's as basic as that. So we have children starting, so we have no concept of God. So how do we make God possible in families where God, um, apart from a word that you might use when things don't go well, is um, how do we do that? And yeah, so that I was, I'm very keenly aware. I think when I started in the college, I, I felt there's this sense of to people who would call themselves Christian, maybe I didn't sound Christian enough because I didn't speak Christianese with people at school. They wouldn't understand it and they would feel alienated. And yet I was very mindful of the people who weren't really comfortable with Christian faith that I would see these tiny, tiny little 
shoots of new faith or tentative faith and I think my role as a minister in that place is to nurture those not to trample them underfoot and not to say well that's not enough you need to do this this and this but to meet people where they are and to just meet them and to have conversations and I'm sure that you do that too Stuart week to week and just meeting people and saying helping them to understand that for them God as we know God to be through Jesus Christ can be possible. Yeah, and I think you, you, you mentioned an expression there, Christianese, um, which I, I think I've always been struck um, that the church has its own language, which is becoming more and more separate from the world we live in. Um, and I, I thought I understood church jargon until I started working uh, for the Salvation Army, who had their own set of Christianese, which was very different, different to Anglicanese. Um, and, and, and it really jarred at me that how do people who aren't formed in the way that I was, who grew up in church land, how do they actually understand what we're on about when we're using all these expressions and, and words that don't make a lot of sense to us? But at the same time, we are called to be different and distinctive. And I think this Bible passage really does challenge us to ask ourselves what of culture is good and what is God and how do we as Christians uh, relate to it? Because there's so much in the world in which we live in that isn't great. We might think in the Western world that, that we've made lots of advances, um, but there's some really unsettling things happening in the world, particularly um, as we look at, as a father um, of, of now a young adult and, and uh, almost teenager, uh, I do have concern about how they feel about themselves. Um, but in, in the school system, I'm sure you see that on a daily day basis and, and you might be able to help us understand some of the dominant culture, some of the Caesars, if you like, of the world that our children are growing up in. So I think the Caesars are definitely materialism, that uh, adults, like our young people, like children, uh, measure themselves by what they have, and it must be the latest of what you have uh, for you to measure up. So materialism definitely, but also that sense of, I need to be beautiful, everything needs to be beautiful, my life needs to be beautiful, and we receive the message from marketing that to be beautiful we need to look beautiful and that costs money you can't be beautiful without spending money that's just a given um, and you need to feel beautiful and that also requires spending money so there's this real pressure to be more than we are and I guess what we see what we saw in the Zacchaeus story is Jesus saying to Zacchaeus Zacchaeus you are enough you can be even more, but Zacchaeus, you are enough. And so to that question that I hear young people asking, am I loved? Am I enough? Jesus says, you are loved regardless of your past, your present. You are loved completely and unconditionally. Am I enough? You are enough. And there are wonderful things that you can do to contribute to the building of the kingdom. You are enough. Join with me in this life, this life lived to the full, and together we can do great things that are not focused on us. Yeah, and I, th and I think uh, I, I, I used to have one of my go-to lines for, for teenagers and young, um, young adults, that, that passage that we are treasure, treasures in jars of clay. Um, and to be able to help them to understand that if you look through the Bible, you don't actually find a cast of perfect, beautiful people. Um, you find some pretty ordinary characters and, and some pretty ugly characters uh, when you look at their character traits. Um, and I, I've been interested, in, um, as I've, I used to say that to young adults and teenagers, I'm saying that more and more to adults, uh, that God doesn't choose the brightest and the best and the most attractive as the ones who reveal who God is, typically in the world. God chooses ordinary people like us because that's how you see God. If you see just a bundle of awesomeness and beauty and talents, there's no room left for God. And so in the world that we live in, 
being able to say that I'm just who I am and I am enough because I know God is the rest. And I think that's, that for me, that's, that's the next stage of, of saying, yes, I'm enough. And Zacchaeus, you are enough. But realising that God is more than what I'm not um, is also something that, that I'm finding is just as helpful for young people as it is for adults these days. And I guess we're all so aware, we become so aware that those people that we might admire who look great, who speak well, who, think, who look like they have everything together. And people like me and you. Um, perhaps yeah. not. <laughs> no. Perhaps like you, Stuart. <laughs> no. no. I, <laughs> all of us. You know, we all look to people that look like they have it all together, only to be so um, distressed for them when we see that their lives actually have the same flaws and yeah. the same emptiness. They are still asking that question, am I enough? We've spent the last few weeks with some clergy actually looking at that passage of being treasures in jars of clay and that um, this image of those things about us that we would choose to change, those experiences that we would certainly choose to have never been through, become the treasure on the inside of these clay pots, these ordinary, everyday clay pots. But as they're there, they become the light that shines out, the light of authenticity, the light of the reality of the presence of God. And it's that brokenness. Mm. It, it, it is that... that um, Zacchaeus's brokenness, our brokenness, be, has a place. Everything belongs, and the light, God's light, we can be salt and light um, to our friends, our neighbours, and our family as we live authentically out of that. Shall I let them in on the secret that please that, do that, that people like you and me, clergy, we don't have it all together. Mm. In fact, I think we probably have it less together than most people, and and so part of. I think the journey uh, for us is to, in that authenticity, is to, to wrestle with what about ourselves, our character, our, our identity, and the culture in which we find ourselves living belongs to God. And what about ourselves and the world we live in that we have to give to culture? Because I think at the moment we're finding ourselves living in quite a restrictive culture. Um, people are are telling us how we should live, how should we, we should stand, who should we, we should say hello to. And so there seems to be a real tension now in what is God's and what is the government of Queensland's or uh, the government of, of Australia or, or, or the world and, and the expectations of that. And so it's been, a, I think, that sort of sense of wrestling with authenticity about ourselves, but also a recognition that we live in a bit of a world that has competing interests. And part of the challenge of this passage is to ask ourselves, what is God's and what is Caesar's or what is, belongs to the culture? And, and it's a daily wrestle with that. And, and how, how do we actually bring uh, a life and authenticity of ourselves that is godly um, when we've got to stand in line a metre and a half away from the next person. Um, we can't gather in church the, the way that we used to. We aren't in church buildings the same way as we used to. Um, we aren't in schools the same way as we used to. So it's, it's a hard thing to be living uh, through at the moment. In, in a, a framework that's quite restricted... I think bringing that sense of wholeness and um, at, at school, our framework at Coomera Anglican College is mind, heart, soul, strength. And I think as we think about mind, heart, soul, strength, that everything that uh, our emotional being and our intellect, our capacities, our strength and the way that we do live physically, I mean, that's what part of one of the great things we celebrate about Christian faith, isn't it? That our physical life actually matters to God and that heaven on earth is how we're to live, that God, where God is, heaven is present and we live within those constraints and yeah. yet we bring life where we are through all the capacities that we have as, as people who aren't um, one thing or another, but we bring all of who we are to our life. And I, and I think that's sort of struck me over the last few weeks as I've been sort of doing some reading, is that maybe how we respond 
to our culture, how we are standing in line and socially distancing and, and grumbling about the borders not being open um, and lamenting about what's going on when we can't see our families as much as we could. I, I wonder, as you said, that, that God is present everywhere. God's with us in those spaces. And making God possible is perhaps even more effective when we allow God to be part of our response to culture. And, yep, I'm probably grumbling about the restrictions more than most. I just don't do it publicly. <laughs> um, but, but maybe I should. And maybe I should be more authentic in that space. And the way that I respond in those challenging times, I pray that that actually does make God possible for others. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. Lord God, our maker and our redeemer, this is your world and we are your people. Bring us healing, wholeness and reconciliation. When we have misused your gifts of creation, in your mercy, forgive us. When we have failed to strive for justice, in your mercy, forgive us. When we have heard the good news of Jesus Christ, but often failed to show and share it with others, in your mercy, forgive us. We have not always loved you with all our heart, nor our neighbours as ourselves. In your mercy, forgive us. May God, who loved the world so much, that he sent his son to be our saviour, forgive you your sins and make you holy to serve him in the world through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. I'm so um, blessed that part of my journey of formation in church world uh, reminded me that God has blessed me regardless of the challenging times that I find myself in. And I was grown up in a culture of giving and generosity. And I know at different times in my life I've struggled um, with my own circumstances to hold on to that culture because I know it's a godly culture. Um, and I know that many of us uh, in these times have found that difficult. Uh, but we are called as the people of God to be a generous people because God is generous and it's a reflection of that acceptance of generous love. Uh, we do have ways to give online, uh, which are on your screen now. We also have old-fashioned ways if you're in the building at the back of the church. There's a little box that you can pop uh, your offering in on the way out. Uh, let me pray. Loving God, you have created us and love us so generously. Help us to be people of generosity, of abundant love, grace, mercy, and forgiveness, of resources enough to share with all. We pray that you will bless all the ways that we offer ourselves to you. Bless all that we are and help us to be aware that you will fill the gaps in with the power of the Holy Spirit. We ask this in your name. Amen. Why don't we stand together as we continue to sing about the hope we have.
Let us pray, Lord, as we come to this uh, time of Holy Communion, this sacrament, this reminder of the generosity of your love, your completing your work in and through your people. Help us uh, to engage, whether we are in a church building or in our home, with the promise that you have called each one of us and claimed us as the body, the church, and through your work and through the power of the Holy Spirit, we know that that is enough. Loving God, we thank you for this world of wonder and delight that you've given to us to care for so that we might enjoy its bounty. We thank you that when we turned away from you, you sent Jesus to live and work as one of us and bring us back to you. You showed us how to love you and set us free to love and serve one another. We thank you that on the cross Jesus took away our sin. All that keeps us from each other and from you. He frees us from hate and fear, from all that destroys love and trust. And so with everyone who believes in you, with all the saints and angels, we rejoice 
and praise you. Our God, you are holy. And now we thank you for these gifts of bread and wine. May we who receive them, as Jesus said, share his body and blood. On the night he was betrayed, Jesus took bread and gave thanks. He broke the bread and gave it to his friends and said, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. After supper, he took the cup and he shared the cup with them and said, This is my blood poured out so that sins may be forgiven. Do this in remembrance of me. You have gathered us together to feed on Christ and to remember all that he has done for us. Fill us with your spirit that we may follow Jesus in all we do and say, working for justice and peace and bringing that justice and peace to this world that you have made. Eternal God, giver of love and power, your Son, Jesus Christ, has sent us into the world to bring good news of his kingdom. Confirm us in this mission and help us to be living examples of this good news. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. The love of the Lord Jesus draw you to himself. The power of the Lord Jesus strengthen you in his service. The joy of the Lord Jesus fill your hearts and the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you now and always. Amen. was lost but now is blind but now I see with my voice to the Savior with my voice to
Let's stand together and sing.
Jesus, church.